Hello, I am Beth Erickson, museum educator at the State Museum of Pennsylvania. Welcome to today's Learn at Lunchtime. This is Adventures in Nature Lab. This program today is both live and in person at the museum and virtual on Zoom. Our topic today is management of the white-tailed deer habitat in Pennsylvania. And with us is Emily D'Amato, a certified wildlife biologist and ecological services section chief for the Pennsylvania Bureau of Forestry at the Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. Hello, Emily, thank you for joining us today. Hi, Beth, thank you for having me. So deer have been a long part of Pennsylvania's history. The white-tailed deer was chosen in 1959 to represent the Commonwealth as the state mammal, but from the time of early settlement in Pennsylvania, human interaction has affected the white-tailed deer population. It isn't easy to find that balance between humans and wildlife. So you're gonna share with us today more about the history of the deer in Pennsylvania and how the deer's habitat is being managed in Pennsylvania forests. Yep, that's correct. I'm really looking forward to it. All right, go ahead, let's get started. I know you put together some slides and information for us. So as Beth mentioned, I am the Ecological Services Section Chief in the Bureau of Forestry. So today I'm really gonna talk to you a lot about the Bureau of Forestry's role in habitat management for deer. And so I'm gonna go through a lot of stuff in, in 20 minutes. So hopefully um, it'll give you a lot of background. And then later, if you'd like details, you can always go to the Pennsylvania Game Commission website or the Bureau of Forestry, you can email me. But to give you a quick overview of what I'm gonna talk about, and as Beth mentioned, deer have quite a roller coaster history in Pennsylvania. So I'm gonna to try to briefly go through that. And it's relevant to their habitat in Pennsylvania. And so then I'm gonna go into a little bit about the Bureau of Forestry's role in, in deer and deer management in the state. And really how we manage for deer and deer habitat is a program called the Deer Management Assistance Program. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that and then try to summarize everything for, for you. So to start with the background of history in PA, as I said, this is, this is uh, quite a history. So there are a lot of details in here that I'm just not gonna be able to go through given the time. So I'm gonna to try to give you the the summary here, and I am going to start way back prior to European settlement. Um, so at this time in Pennsylvania's history, deer were actually pretty limited and, and kept in check and balance with the habitat that they had here in the state. And this was for a couple of different reasons. Uh, one is at that time, Pennsylvania was really a mature forest landscape. And so that did provide habitat and food for deer, but it doesn't provide the variety of habitat that deer really would need to thrive. So deer like some early stage succession, some middle stage succession, age classes basically a forest and um, mature. So they like a mix. So at this time, they just had one kind of age class mainly across the state. Another reason deer were really kept in balance in the, in the state during this time is they had Pretty large predators roaming Pennsylvania. So we did have, believe it or not, wolves and mountain lions in the state at that time. And we also had Native Americans who were hunting deer, uh, mostly for subsistence hunting, for, for eating for their families and themselves. And then we saw a pretty big shift when Europeans started to come into Pennsylvania and settle the area we really started to see, this is when we started to see an increase in the deer population. And there were a lot of reasons for this, but two of the main ones really were, uh, we started to, to kind of come in and start hunting those large carnivores and decrease the population of, of those predators that were hunting the deer. And then we did a lot of land clearing as well. Um, as a lot of you probably know, the pencil, this history of Pennsylvania, we had a lot of land clearing for agriculture and then logging. Um, so this actually created some of that early successional habitat for the deer um, at that time. So it gave them an opportunity to have, have a little bit more uh, food and then they were being hunted a little less by those predators that weren't on the landscape as much. 
But then uh, the roller coaster started for them really in the early 1800s, we actually saw deer nearly disappear in the state, which is actually pretty hard to believe. Um, and this was due to a couple of different things. So obviously, if, you know, you see something quite frequently out on the landscape, you're new to the area and you're looking for food, um, you're going to start hunting that species and not only eating it for yourself and your family, um, but at that time people were doing market hunting. So they would hunt large numbers of animals and then sell it at market for other people to eat. And at that time um, in the early 1800s, we didn't have any agencies in Pennsylvania to uh, manage any of the wildlife or the habitat. So it was really unregulated deer hunting. And at that time, we also started to see some habitat changes uh, Pennsylvania was actually starting to become quite denuded of, 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 of uh, habitat. So a lot of that land clearing, um, we weren't allowing regeneration. We weren't allowing trees to come back up. And so it started to limit the food supply out there for deer. So this is, this is when we started to see a significant decrease in deer populations in the state. And it really wasn't until about the late 1800s that people started to think about protection, or at least it, it was uh, documented in history that people were getting concerned about the lack of deer in the state. So in 1883, which I believe is when they thought they had killed the last year in Pennsylvania, they hadn't, but they, they thought they had, a, a group of hunters formed this Sportsman's Association, uh, Pennsylvania Sportsman's Association. And really what the goal of this group was to, that they wanted to lobby the legislation, legislator for an agency that would actually protect the wildlife. So that did happen. And in 1895, the Pennsylvania Game Commission was created. And so the Pennsylvania Game Commission, if you're not familiar, is the, the agency in Pennsylvania that does um, set the, bag, the seasons and bag limits for deer in the state. Well, actually, and, and protects all wildlife in the state and habitat. Um, and so at this time when they were created, you know, their really main concern at that point was this low numbers or possibly no deer in Pennsylvania. And so they started implementing a deer management system that was designed to protect the does or the females, since they are the, the ones reproducing. And they wanted to try to maximize the population, bring the population back to Pennsylvania. And also at that time in 1893, we had the creation of the Pennsylvania Forestry Commission. So in this 1893, 1895 time period, we had both protection for the wildlife and then we started to see land getting protected as well. So then in early 1900s, Really between 1900 and 1925, we started to see some significant deer recovery. Again, we, because of the protection of the land from the uh, Forestry Commission, we were starting to see that land regenerating or trees coming back, vegetation coming back. And so that was happening pretty vigorously. And at the same time, the Game Commission was actually introducing, re reintroducing deer into the state. So between 1906 to 1925, the Game Commission released about 1,200 deer onto the state. So by the 1930s, we really started to see a population rebound. You know, everything was kind of coming together for them to really be able to, to reproduce and, and come back in the state. And they really came back pretty quickly. So in between 1905 and 1928, as best as we can tell, the population went from about 1,000 to 1 million. So that's a pretty significant increase in really not a, a lot of time. And pretty quickly by the 1938, we started to actually see documentation of deer problems in the state. So you can see this article here on the screen is, is the Pennsylvania deer problem. And like I said, that was 1938, people started to see that deer were actually starting to negatively impact our forests and our agricultural crops. So this picture that I just popped up there is a deer browse line on some trees um, that you still can sometimes see in neighborhoods, neighborhoods today. 
um, but uh, certainly a lot less than we saw back then. So this, this kind of conversation between um, biologists and Pennsylvania citizens really went on through the 70s as to, you know, how many deer should we have in the state? Is there an impact? Um, and, and it really kind of peaked in the 70s. Um, and then we started to, it started to kind of, you know, peak based on research. We started to really look into the, the impacts that deer were having and looking at capacity, how, how many deer could a forest really have out there and started to look at forest-based deer management. And so the Game Commission made a real push to try to reduce the population. So in the 2000s, um, the population, in my opinion, really started to stabilize and the Game Commission shifted to managing deer, not so much based on density, but deer health, looking at three things really, deer health, forest health, and deer human conflicts. So this is still, um, still kind of ongoing, this, this deer management, how many should we have, how many is good for the, the landscape. Um, and it, it, you can see it's been really this up and down and kind of crazy ride for, for deer in Pennsylvania. And we're, we're um, I think in a, a, be, a much better place now, but it's never really been easy for managing deer in the state and, and habitat. So there's a lot going on. There has been a lot going on. So kind of where are we today? Um, so those efforts that have been made, there have been so many here over the, you know, since the 70s to really balance the deer population. And so we are seeing improving forest habitat conditions um, across Pennsylvania. So some of the signs we, we've been, the Pennsylvania Bureau of Forestry collects a lot of data and I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a minute, but um, these are just quick graphs for you to see the one on the, on the left with the seedlings per mill acre. This is just data we've been collecting across the state. And if you just kind of focus on the red, red dots on the lines there, um, this goes from 1997, it's a little out of date, it goes up to 2013, but you can start to see the increase there towards the right side of the graph that we're getting more seedlings out there. So that, that's a good thing for the forest. We wanna see more tree seedlings out on the landscape. And then the graph to the right is um, Indian cucumber, which is a wildflower we like to see out in the forest. And you can pretty clearly see, I put a trend line in there that since 1998, we've uh, seen a 6% increase in Indian cucumber across the forest. Uh, however, you know, it's, it's a good, we're seeing a lot of good things, but we also are seeing areas where we have these legacy effects. And really the ecological definition of a legacy effect is a change in ecosystem state caused by one species. And I just want to say here that a, a lot of the problems or issues we're having in Pennsylvania habitat, it's not just deer, it's, it's, there's a, a large combination, but for today's conversation, I'm just gonna be talking about deer. So this legacy effect of deer is, again, change in ecosystem state caused by one species, where this change can actually continue or persist after there's either a reduction in that population or even an extirpation in the population, which we don't want to see in the state. So the pictures below are, are examples of legacy effects of, of long-term deer impacts in Pennsylvania. The one on the left there is um, a hay-scented fern kind of landscape. And the one on the right is Mount Laura. I'm gonna explain a little bit about more about this legacy effect and, and habitat here, my next slide. So, what we're seeing, those two pictures I showed there are, are those legacy impacts of overabundant deer on the landscape for a long period of time. And I you know, really wanna highlight that that's overabundant deer impacts. And if you remember going back to our history line there, it was quite a long period of time that we had high levels of deer in the state. And, and now I'm gonna talk a little bit about why or how that caused a problem, those legacy impacts. So deer are selective browsers which really just means that they are pretty kind of picky. <laughs> they have preferred species that they like to eat um, and other species that they really don't want to eat. 
So this does vary this list of preferred species. It's going to vary by, you know, where they are in the state, what's available to them, uh, what they're used to eating. So I, I don't, I'm not going to show you a long list of those, but we'll, we'll talk a, a little bit about some of them in, in the next couple slides. Um, but over time, what this can do is if you have too many deer on the landscape, they're going to you know, pick out what they want to eat. They're targeting some specific trees and wildflowers out in the forest, and they're going to reduce the numbers of those. So basically reducing biodiversity. So the numbers of different tree species and wildflower species might be out there. Um, we also can see some forest regeneration failures. So the picture that just popped up in the lower corner there is actually from the Allegheny National Forest in the 1970s. And you can see the individuals standing on the one side of the fence where deer are allowed, and you can see the landscape there. And then on the other side of the fence, um, deer are excluded, and you can see the vegetation there. So that's a really good example of when you have too many deer, um, you know, they're, they're gonna eat, they need to eat. And so they're gonna eat what they, what they can find and and unfortunately sometimes that causes failures in the trees to really grow for the next re, uh, next generation of, of, of people. Um, and as I mentioned a little bit in our last slide they can also influence plant composition. So they're gonna go through and you know pick out their preferred species um, and what's that gonna leave? That's gonna leave the species that they don't wanna eat. So essentially their, their broccoli and Brussels sprouts are kind of beech or hay-scented fern or, or straight maple, things like that. And so you start to see an increase in those on the landscape. And then unfortunately what that can do is it, it can actually change the soil microorganisms. So by changing plant composition, so for example, these hay-scented ferns you see in this picture, um, in particular, alter soil nutrient cycling, which really is, is just going to change what grows there in the future. So it actually can change the trajectory of forest vegetation development in the future, even when you've reduced the population. So those are some of the things that we've, we have seen in Pennsylvania um, uh, from over, those overabundant deer impacts. Um, that happened for from basically the 30s through the 70s. And so what's the Bureau of Forestry's role in, in deer and, and deer habitat in the state? So as I mentioned earlier, the Pennsylvania Game Commission is the agency with legal or uh, legislative authority to manage wildlife in the state. So obviously that includes deer, but all wildlife and the habitat that supports their existence. So they're the ones, you know, that are setting the seasons and bag limits for the species and providing protection, et cetera. So the Bureau of Forestry, um, we are under the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, and we're the agency with legislative authority to manage for sustainable forests and conserve native wild plants. So we have about 2.2 million acres in Pennsylvania, and hopefully you can you can kind of see the tie in there with, with deers, you know, in us trying to manage sustainable forests and native wild plants, we're really uh, a big part of deer's habitat. Uh, we're gonna be providing a lot of their food and cover um, and making sure there's, there's a balance, you know, that there are enough deer out there, but there are also uh, a balance of deer out there that we can still reproduce our, our forests and our native wild plants. So, like I said, we are gonna manage the habitat on our lands and also promote sustainable deer management on all Commonwealth forest lands. And so on our lands on those 2.2 million acres, we're gonna do this in a couple of different ways. One of which is fencing. So a lot of you are probably familiar with some of the large fences we have out on state forest land, mostly around timber sales. This is not our go-to. We would really prefer not to have fencing. It is very expensive and it does keep wildlife out of areas, which we don't prefer. But if we see that an area is going to fail potentially, uh, so basically we're not going to see the tree regeneration we need to grow another forest, we are going to take the step to fence it. We also do a lot of silviculture treatments, which um, are basically different logging operations on state forest land. 
again, we make sure we're doing those all in a, a sustainable manner and we are certified from outside experts to make sure we're doing that. But this, this also creates habitat for deer and other wildlife. So basically we wanna make sure that what we cut is regenerating. And so to do that, we also do some mowing practices, herbicide treatments of uh, things that might inhibit that tree regeneration. And so we're creating habitat. We're trying to create the best habitat for all species we can through the silviculture treatments, um, mowing, herbicide plantings. And on average, we are gonna harvest about 14,000 14, acres of timber every year. We also really need hunters on, on uh, state forest land and we want hunters to be able to recreate on state forest land. So we try to open as many roads as we can, particularly during the hunting season. So on average, we have about 3,000 miles of roadway. We also um, support research, particularly with deer and um, forests and, and habitat. And right now we have a really extensive study going on called the Deer Forest Study. Um, that's kind of the short name for it. And just given time, I'm not going to explain it too much, but if you just Google the Pennsylvania Deer Forest Study, there's a really neat blog that um, gets posted pretty regularly, and it's, it's great, a great resource, great information. So I would highly recommend hopping on to that Deer Forest Study blog. The Bureau of Forestry also really tries to in increase communication and public education on on deer and, and forestry and um, our hunting opportunities. We do have an interactive hunting website that's pretty neat. We work with the Game Commission on that. So we have both information from the Game Commission and Bureau of Forestry on that website. We do habitat tours. We have meetings with stakeholders. We do tons of habitat monitoring, which I could spend hours talking to you about, but I'll try to refrain. Um, and then really what I'm gonna talk about for the rest of this presentation is our use of a program called the Deer Management Assistance Program. So the Deer Management Assistance Program is, is a, a tool that was implemented by the Game Commission in 2001. And what it does is it allows private landowners to actually apply for and receive additional doe tags or these antlerless tags to bring the deer population down even more than what you might have in the wildlife management unit, that larger man at the management unit that the Game Commission um, manages for. And this is really to meet specific landowner objectives. So it's very, you know, much more site specific. And so the Bureau of Forestry does enroll in this program. Um, and this is really our biggest tool to try to work in areas that have some deer impact that we'd like to see reduced. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit how, about how we implement this program. So we do have goals and objectives when we uh, put areas into the DMAP program. And really our goal is to try to allocate the number of permits that are gonna help an area give us long-term uh, forest health and productivity. And specifically, our objectives are to try to increase tree and plant diversity in these areas. We want to provide hunters with additional tags. So when we do get these tags, they are for sale to hunters. Um, so they can come in and, and use those tags on state forest land and to improve all wildlife habitat. So how do you know if you are actually meeting those objectives? You really need to be collecting data. So we started this uh, vegetation impact protocol, and it's a statistically based sampling protocol that's out across state forest land. And so these plots that we have set up across the state monitor vegetation conditions that are affected by deer. So it, it looks like quite a few things, but the two most important things, because there are objectives, are we're counting tree seedlings, and we're also counting deer browsed plants or wildflowers. These wildflowers are really important. Um, we consider these indicator species of, of deer being in balance with an area. Um, there's been a lot of information, um, literature and anecdotal information about looking at these wildflowers because they never outgrow the reach of deer like a tree will. And they may tell us a little more quickly how an area is doing, how healthy an area is doing. 
And we've particularly picked out some, uh, a handful of these wildflowers that we think can help tell us how the population is doing in an area. So for example, I showed you that graph of the Canada Mayflower earlier, and this picture is a trillium. Those are two plants that we picked out to particularly monitor. And as I mentioned, these are statistically based protocols. So we had to have a lot of plots out there. So our foresters are actually out there doing a great job of collecting data on more than 10,000 plots that we have statewide. So we really wanna make sure that we are, are implementing this program um, in a correct way, you know, that we're doing it to meet our objectives. So all that data is basically gonna show us whether tree regeneration is increasing or decreasing, if we have inhibiting vegetation out there, competing vegetation. So maybe it's not the deer, maybe there are other things going on in that area. And then it's gonna show us if we're looking at the right wildflowers and if those wildflowers are increasing or decreasing in an area. So here's that Canada Mayflower again, and this is in a particular spot. So you see it's only a 3% increase, but then you don't see any change in that Jack in the pulpit. So maybe that's not one that we wanna be monitoring to look at deer impact. And then finally, this is a little bit complicated slide and, and I don't mean to really go through the numbers with you, but um, just showing you that, that we then put all the data into a, a, a model, basically an enrollment decision um, spreadsheet. And we're gonna look at the data. We're gonna look at what we call combined utility functions. So we, have, we do have thresholds, um, measured thresholds that we want for each DMAP unit. And so that combined utility function is gonna tell us if we're meeting those. We put it all into a model and then it kind of shoots out a recommendation for these different management units um, as to whether or not we should maybe increase tags, stabilize tags, maintain tags, or, or um, you know, maybe not have one enrolled at all. So that really helps us determine if we need to enroll an area in this program to create better habitat, not just for deer, but other wildlife as well. And so actually this protocol is, is a little bit unique. Um, it's unique because it's often quite difficult to collect data that is going to tell you something about deer when you're not collecting deer density numbers. Um, and so I could spend an hour kind of talking about that, um, but it is pretty unique and it is so far working for us. We are seeing um, the trends and changes that we were hoping to. And so we've had a lot of requests for this protocol um, including Wisconsin, New York, and then quite a couple of schools there in New York and Rhode Island. And so to try to summarize all of that, um, the Bureau of Forestry, our mission is to sustain Pennsylvania forests and conserve native wild plants. And so deer are a really important component of that. We want to see deer on the landscape, but we, we are a part of trying to manage their habitat so that we can see those plants and, and forests regrow for future generations. And our management involves um, fencing, harvest, uh, not only deer harvest, but timber harvest, research, communicating with the public, and particularly the DMAP program. And the DMAP program for us is, is quite extensive. We use data and decision model, and we try to, to do it in the best way that we can. And so with that, I'll, I'll wrap it up and, and thank you guys for inviting me. And I have my email up here. If anyone has any additional questions um, afterwards, you can certainly feel free to email me. Emily, that was great. Thank you so much. And there are definitely questions. So um, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> one of them is, so some people want deer in their yards while others see them as a pest. So really, what should we consider deer? Pests or pals? What do you think? Oh, that's such a good question. So, I mean, for me, deer are pals. I like to see deer on the landscape. And I think like any, anything, when they become out of balance with where they live, they certainly can become a problem. Um, I don't, I don't know that I'd call them a pest, but I know they can definitely cause problems. I mean, they've, they've caused problems on our state forest system. Um, like I had mentioned in regeneration, I know they can be a problem in, in gardens. 
Um, my, my sister lives in Virginia and she's always calling me, how can I stop these deer from eating my garden? Um, and so, yeah, when, when deer are not in balance with their habitat, they can absolutely become a problem on the landscape. So I understand the term for both, um, but hopefully, you know, if we can continue to have them in balance in certain areas, they can be our pals. So you mentioned uh, earlier, talked a little bit about other species of plants and animals affecting the deer habitat. What about these? We have so many invasive species that we're seeing come in. People are concerned about um, spotted lantern flies and other animals and plants. How are they affecting the deer habitat? Yeah, so invasive plant species in particular are really um, not good habitat for most wildlife in Pennsylvania. Um, most wildlife in, in the state have, have developed and, and lived with our native plants. And so they can digest them, they provide uh, good nutrition for them. And so as we start to see this increase in invasive plant species, um, it, it's not good habitat. It's not a good food source for deer, but also other wildlife in the state. So that is a problem. The pests are also a, a problem for deer because they can uh, take away their cover and their natural kind of native uh, habitat. So, you know, for example, uh, hemlock woolly delgid, Hemlock can be a really good cover species for deer and other, and other wildlife. And as we start to see the hemlock woolly delgid imp impact our, our state tree there, um, that does, that does cause, can cause a problem for cover for a lot of species. So, it, you know, we always should be trying to plant natives, um, even if we have a small, you know, small part uh, of property. Um, planting natives is always good and trying to reduce the invasives, but it is getting hard. I know we've, we're starting to see quite a few invasive species in, in Pennsylvania, not only the plants, but the, the um, animals as well. So yeah, it, it's, it's going to be a problem for deer as well. We had another question specifically about something that deer eat. You showed a picture of the pink lady slippers. Are mm -hmm. they a plant that deer regularly consume? We have seen deer um, munching, or at least the brows, the, the brows on, on pink lady slipper. Um, we actually have a, a site in one of our state forests that's uh, a beautiful uh, landscape of pink lady slipper that we fenced. Um, we were just trying to protect it. And so, yes, it is one that we have seen them browse on. That's interesting. Now, the, uh, Last week, I believe, there was a Learn at Lunchtime that talked about passenger pigeons. Mm -hmm. So one of our listeners has a question about, was there similar concern about protecting passenger pigeons as there, had, as there was about deer in the late 19th century? And I that might be outside your realm of yeah. expertise. So. Uh, yeah, I feel like I should know that. Um, but I, I'm just not as well, can't think right now of, you know, how that, how that um, impacted our thoughts. I, I do know that there was concern after they were extirpated because passenger pigeons, there were so many of them. Um, and we did start to see this shift in thinking and concern, but it did take a while. I know for, for those concerns to really um, start to, action, I guess, in terms of protecting wildlife. So I think the accumulation of, of all of those concerns really helped us with the um, creation of agencies like the Game Commission and the Forestry Commission. Um, you know, we really were just seeing this overall kind of concern and, and loss of species. Well, Emily, this, I, this was fantastic. I thank you so much for, you know, coming on board here and sharing this valuable information about the management of white-tailed deer habitat in Pennsylvania. If we have any other questions, I think we got them all. So that was great. You had so much information. So thank you so much for being with us today. <laughs> thank you so much for inviting me. And, and if anyone has any further questions, feel free to email me anytime. The links are in the chat box for um, the Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources website and the State Museum of Pennsylvania's website. So please use those if you need to be in touch. 
as well as our email. And we will share again Emily's email with you. So if you have any further questions, you can be in touch. Otherwise, we're going to invite you to um, see some of our future. Let's see. I'm going to share my screen here, Emily. Thank you. All right. Thank there you. So coming up, we have some more Learn at Lunchtime programs. October 15th is Dr. Kirk Carr um, talking about the peopling and the Americas. And then next month for our program here in Nature Lab, we hope everyone will join us for a conversation with Thomas Keller, a fur bearer biologist with the Pennsylvania Game Commission, as we talk about the wild dog population in Pennsylvania. You can visit our website to sign up for this and other upcoming programs. Today's program was recorded and will be available on the PHMC YouTube page. Thank you everybody for attending. Again, thank you, Emily, and have a great day.